Dr. G, one thing about this movement is that we have the best ideas in the worst organization. Finally, you're trying to organize, as is Steve Bannon, but this has been a, a massive issue that we have the best ideas. We have no uh, backbone in terms of we have no structure or apparatus to push them forward. Uh, it is totally ad hoc the way we're doing it. This is how the left kicks our butts, and this is how the establishment Republicans are, are able to hang on even though their ideas stink. They're, they're, you're putting uh, number one. You're putting us out of business, Alex. No more really good callers, okay? Because then we're, we're all going to get pushed out, okay? Um, secondly, there was another very ad hoc thing I, I seem to recall about 230 years ago called the American Revolution. Um, it didn't have any structure. Didn't have a ground game. Didn't have any organization. Uh, that's what we've got to do again in the political sense. I, I totally right. agree with those people. It wasn't me. It was Mike Flynn who originally said this. He said that November the 8th, uh, 2016, was a political revolution. And I, I think it still is. You just, just look at recent events, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's uh, Alabama, whether it's uh, Corker, whether it's Denton. All of these people, all of these events tell you the direction in which politics is heading in this country. And, and if you watch the Mitch McConnell impromptu uh, press event with the president two days ago, just look at Mitch's body language. Look at his face. His cage has been rattled. And, and there's nobody better than Steve to do that. But it is, it is you know, Breitbart is just riding the crest of the wave of a, a, a people who want to, to have their representative government back. And this isn't just an isolated event. This isn't just one presidential candidate in American history. It's everything that's going on in Europe. You look at the recent events, you look at Brexit, you look at the recent elections across Europe. It, the, the, the business as usual politics has demonstrated itself to be utterly bankrupt, not just financially, but also morally. And that's why we're taking the country back. So, you know, it, it, it may, may be ad hoc in the beginning, but some beautiful things can come out of individuals coming together and demanding that the founding values of the republic be reflected by the political elite in this capital. Okay, so Dr. Sebastian Gorka is with me, and uh, I, I want to take callers with you, Dr. G, because they always have great sure. questions for you. Uh, but I yeah. do have one topic I want to bring up with you first, which is that ISIS is suffering heavy losses in Raqqa or Raqqa. I don't know how you want to pronounce it, but ISIS is really losing its claim to a caliphate. It's losing its uh, geographic I I imperial status, and I think this is a huge victory for uh, the United States. States, for President Trump, and for this audience that has taken ISIS seriously, I think you as well. Uh, and yet this is all pushed off the front page because the, the president is, is squabbling with the media uh, over some comments about Gold Star families. And I just want to get your thoughts on how significant it is that allegedly 6,000 ISIS terrorists have been killed uh, in recent days and, and the media's non-reaction to it. Two quick things. Uh, if, if this had happened under Obama, this is all you would have heard for for months. But this is massive. Two, two things have happened of geostrategic importance in just the scant eight months of the Trump administration. Number one, uh, Mosul was liberated. Mosul is incredibly important because that's the city from where at the Mosul Grand Mosque, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, declared the reestablishment of the new caliphate. So the, the symbolic value of Mosul being liberated from ISIS was huge because the caliphate's birthplace was, was retaken. And now with, with the fall of Raqqa, but we have the, the, not just the symbolic heart of ISIS, we have the operational heart, the, the real headquarters of, of ISIS. Are being taken down. So uh, ISIS is, is now just something that needs to be mopped up and our military will do it. And this is eight months. I mean, this is incredible. This shows you what, what willpower, what, what determination, what the unleashing of our military can achieve. So number one, these are massive stories. And I'm glad that there are at least places like Breitbart that understand that. But secondly, and this is really important to me, the, 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 this, this false story uh, with regards to what the president said to the <clears throat> the mother of this special forces uh, soldier that fell 
I know exactly what the president said to that woman. I, I don't need to be on the call because he said it in front of me again and again and again. What the president said to that woman is, it is all the more impressive that a man like your son took this job upon himself knowing the risks involved. That's what the president said. And to have that shamelessly twisted into some kind of sarcastic statement such as, well, that's what he signed up for. It is absolutely inexcusable, but that's where we are today. And that's why, Andrew, that, that clip you, you start every show with, don't ever stop using it. That's why Andrew was right. We have to destroy the New York Times and CNN for all their lies, because this is what they're doing right now with that presidential phone call. Yeah, it really is truly amazing how prescient Andy Breitbart was, and he's just he he seems more wise as the years go on. Uh, but it, it's what is the truth about this saga and this scandal that's erupted with the president uh, and the Gold Star families with Frederica Wilson and her crazy hat somehow getting involved? What's really the truth here, Doctor G? Because everyone knows the president respects the troops. I don't think the president should have heckled Obama for not calling gold star families uh, i thought that i thought that was misguided but why did it have to get to this level it does feel like a, a, a cooked media manipulation yeah i i was, I, I had um, <clears throat> for my sins i had coffee with a a, a senior uh, a media uh, producer with with one of the the fake news media uh, channels yesterday and and this lady was told i mean she revealed everything you need to know she said um yeah, I, well, my bosses tell me that I need to spend days on finding out the source for whether or not Rex Tillerson called the president a moron. That's news today. And I, and, I, and I said to her, look, there are women right now as we sit here, we were in Trump Hotel, as we sit here comfortably sipping our coffee, there are women being sold into sex slavery by jihadists. And, and you're dedicating hundreds of man hours to the story as to whether or not a cabinet member used a mildly rude word about the president. That's where we are today. But you know, the good news is they are paying the penalty. The mainstream media, what my friend Andrew Sarabian calls the fake news industrial complex, are tanking. If, if the Washington Post weren't a vanity project for Jeff Bezos, it wouldn't be wrapping fish and chips up. I mean, it would, it would be maybe lying <laughs> at the face. Um, so, so, you know, not only is Andrew Breitbart more prescient every day, he is more relevant. And I, I, I want all your readers to go back, if they've read it before, do it again. If they haven't bought it already, righteous indignation. I learned more about what I had to deal with in the White House from that one book than anything else I've ever read. So, Andrew Breitbart, God bless you and, and keep on doing what you do, Alex. All right. Thanks, Dr. G. Let's bring in some callers. Questions for Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Aaron in Georgia, your first stop. Aaron, let's go. Dr. G, Marlo. Morning. Um, I, I admire both of you guys. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I just have a question for both of you. And Cindy and Cindy, those are some bulldogs right there. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> bulldogs. But the, I've been in the fire service for 15 years, going on 20 years. And your thoughts on these spontaneous wildfires in California. I've talked to a lot of people. I know some folks out there. Do you think this could be terrorism? Because in Portugal and Spain, you know, they called some arsonists and, you know, they, they labeled them as terrorists. Just your thoughts on, on that. Uh, thanks all for taking my call. Thanks, Aaron. Dr. Thanks. G, quick, quick, quick response from you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, t terrorism has to have some kind of political or ideological end state in mind. A lot of these fires, we find, found out the individual has some kind of psychotic issue. Let's wait and see. I'm not ruling it out. The investigation is underway. But for this to be terrorism, it has to be 
somebody with a political or ideological motive, not just a psychotic one or not just a financial one. So let's let let's allow the good investigators to do their work. Yeah, kind of the the crass definition of terrorism, Dr. G, is when you're really targeting innocence and you're doing it because of a, a political or ideological motive, right? Yeah. I mean, those are those are kind of the two components. Absolutely, absolutely. It can't, it can't be killing people for the sake of killing people because then then you'll dread Jeffrey Dahm or the Boston Strang, but there has to be a political, ideological, or religious end state you wish to achieve. So let, let's see if that's a, a possible motivation behind the attack. All right, let's keep it rolling. Amy in Pennsylvania, question for Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Uh, yes, hello. Um, great to speak with both of you. Um, you. Actually, uh, since she brought up something, she, well, she started to bring up something about DACA. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a program called Angel Tree. This, this no. is my point with the entire DACA, and I don't know how to get the information to where it needs to go. But Angel Tree is an organization that's in churches around Christmas time. It's the names of children with their parents incarcerated. And there's over a million United States citizen children with parents, either one or both of their parents in jail for sometimes minor drug possession charges and things like that. Nobody seems worried. And the majority of these are minorities. Nobody seems worried about their families being broken up by following the rule of law. And I'm trying to figure out, in addition, in addition to that, you have how many 94 million people out of the workforce? Why is this not a part of this this talking point about this situation. I don't know how to get this information into the political sphere because these are our American citizens and why aren't we helping them first? Why aren't we bringing their needs to the forefront? Because I really, to be personally honest, I don't hate illegal immigrants, but I don't believe that they should be taken care of before United States citizens and nobody cares about these children who are in homes with their grandparents or, or, or aunts or uncles because their parents have been locked up for some minor reason and yet we have people coming over the border which is also a crime and they are criminals and they are going to get all these blessings afforded to them. It, it, it's unfair. Okay, th th thanks, Amy. I appreciate the the call, and this is a, something, Doctor G, that I've been pointing out on the show, uh, and then we'll get your response. Uh, that this debate has been hijacked to focus on a handful of DACA recipients, and that's well over half of the public conversation, where that is a fraction of whatever immigration reform is going to address. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a fabulous point. I'm going to check this program out. But but it really returns to what undergirds everything we were doing in the administration. And in fact, what we campaigned for during the campaign. The policy platforms of the president weren't ad hoc and they weren't accidental. Whether it's the wall, whether it's the immigration ban, whether it's defeating ISIS, whether it's unleashing the economy. All of these things are linked by one philosophical concept, national sovereignty. Uh, it's a reassertion of a national sovereignty, and that's why the president said again and again and again, especially when he gave that Paris uh, climate accord speech, I was elected to be the president for the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And this goes to your caller's point. We have you know, America first doesn't mean arrogance, doesn't mean unilateralism. It means serving the interests of this nation and for mostly its citizens first. That's absolutely uh, reasonable. It's, it's the foundation of any nation's survival. And, and I think the point that we have to look after broken families here first, whether they're broken by uh, crime, whether they're broken by opioid abuse, before we assist charitably anybody else, that is just a reassertion of common sense. All right, Trevor in Virginia, line four. Your question for Dr. Gorka. Good morning, fellas. How y'all doing today? Great. Good. Great. Um, first of all, I got to say, Dr. Gorka, you are one of my uh, heroes. Uh, as a young man, I've learned a lot about radical extremism uh, in terms of Islam from you and uh, Philip Haney. I'm sure you guys both know who Philip Haney is. Um, yep. Either way, um, I wanted to ask you, 
fundamentally, what is different now than than nine months ago and then the years before <laughs> that in this administration than the Obama administration? Why could we not do this during the Obama administration? To me, it seems like nothing is different. I'll tell you exactly what's different. The president gave a radio interview uh, yesterday or the day before to a friend of mine, Chris Plum, and uh, he was asking him about what, what's changed. What, well, how come we're suddenly, you know, kicking the backside of ISIS? And he said, very. The president replied, you know, without without any script. He said, well, it's very easy. Uh, now we're fighting to win. Under Obama, we were fighting to be politically correct. Uh, that's what it takes. Uh, the first time I met Donald Trump, the summer of 2015 in his office, within seconds of us discussing national security issues, I realized two things about this man. He hates political correctness, number one. That's why you know he's so sympathetic. Secondly, he knew we are at war with the jihadists, and he wanted to win this war. So what you've seen in the last eight months is ingredient number one for victory, the will to actually win. And that's why ISIS is crumbling in a matter of months as opposed to years and years of it growing and growing. Wonderful. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was thinking. And to be completely honest, it, it is shameful that all it took was the flip of a switch. And it, it's, it's just, it, it blows me away. But anyways, thank y'all. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Trevor. Great call. Let's, add, let's go to Victor in California. Victor, you got a question for Dr. Sebastian Gorka. I do. So first of all, just uh, appreciate your book. I read it and um, uh, it's an honor to talk to you. Listen, uh, earlier in the show, uh, Alex had a uh, guest uh, woman there uh, representing the, the Kurdish government. And, you know, it, it seems to me that our country, since this whole war on terror uh, began, we've been bouncing from bed to bed with people who are our enemies. And this little group of people who you know more than I do, the Peshmergas and the Kurds, they're fighters, man. They, 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 they don't need much, man. You just point them in the direction and they go get it. And we're leaving them, out, we're leaving them hanging out to dry. And I'm just wondering, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Dr. Gorka, a very important question, Victor. Thank you. It's. It's a little bit more complicated than just them being cool dudes and, hard, and uh, tough fighters. Uh, you, you've got to dial it back a little bit. The uh, PR for the Kurds is very good, but sometimes it doesn't match reality. And secondly, there are some real issues with regards to how they treat Christians, especially around the Nineveh Plain. So it's not, it's not a white hat, black hat issue here. Also, uh, they didn't do them. It, it's, it's not, but, but, but Dr. G, we have to be relative here, which is that we're basically the, the party line for the State Department and for the Trump administration right now is granting a, a complete and utter equivalence, at least publicly, between Iranian-backed forces, Shiite forces, the Iraqi government, and the Kurds. And there, there's no one side that's better or more favorable or a better ally, uh, according to – the president's uh, own personnel and what they're saying. Yeah, but but one one quick uh, clarification there. They're not the president's personnel. I, I spoke to people in the region, Kurds who are negotiating with Americans on the ground right there now, uh, and the, everybody in the room they're talking to is an Obama holdover. That's the issue. The issue is that Kurdish policy, as long as Brett McGurk is the special envoy, he's Obama's man, he's a bag carrier for you know, Sh uh, Shiite interest, as long as we don't change out the personnel that are writing the reports that are interacting with the people on the ground, we will continue to see these very bad policies enacted at the operational and theater level. So, you know, I don't know what Rex is doing, but he needs to change out the personnel because he's got people representing this president who do not believe in this president. That's the right. issue. Yes, I that, that, I 100% agree with that. But let's say uh, let's let's play Monday morning quarterback here a little bit, Doctor G. And let's say you're a high-ranking official in the State Department. Well, what is your recommendation for what should be done in the situation? Uh, well, first things first, I would have said don't hold the referendum. Uh, yes, Kurdistan is a is a functional, you know, autonomous region already. But we have to stabilize Iraq before you secede or do anything of that ilk. So hold your horses, Kurds. Uh, take a take a t you know, take a, a break. Count to ten, and in the meantime, replace people with seasoned 
You know, there are people who've worked that region for years who understand the players and aren't going to facilitate Iran. The big challenge right now is that the one thing we have to do, in addition to stopping the bloodshed, is making sure that this country of Iraq uh, it doesn't simply become an extension of Iran. And Iran is milking our victories for their own success. That's what we have to stop, and that's what the State Department should be part of. Fascinating stuff. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, he's the chief strategist for the MAGA Coalition, former deputy assistant to the president, and former national security editor for Breitbart. Super generous with your time today, Dr. G. Why don't you throw out a, a plug for whatever it is you'd like to plug? The floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you kindly. It's been a great uh, half an hour. So uh, check out our website, magacoalition.com, M-A-G-A coalition, magacoalition.com. We are the super PAC for the forgotten men and women that voted for the outsider Donald Trump to be president. And if you haven't got it already, check out Defeating Jihad. It's online, Amazon, iTunes, you name it. Yeah, and it's a, I, I read it. It's a very readable book, especially those of you who are sort of uninitiated to asymmetric warfare and radical Islam. I, I think it's something that I highly recommend. Pick up two, give one to uh, a friend or family member. One other thing also, Dr. G, 597 reviews on Amazon, four and a half stars. That's tough to do, especially knowing that there's going to be a handful. <laughs> there's going to be a handful of trolls that are going to come in just because they don't like you. Uh, so so they're, they're, it, it's a, this is a very very popular book and for good reason. Thank you kindly. Yes, the, the hobbits have been kind to me. <laughs>